so I thought before we even fully get started, even though we're recording, um, to just say hello and um, introduce ourselves before we get nice and cozy. Danny, it's so good to see you again. Um, so my name, I'm Martine, as everybody, as we all know. Um, I'm so pleased that both of you are here with me, with, with Jill, as well as Ahmad. Um, uh, we are all three members of the diversity committee, and we are also, we've been having conversations about getting people in a room to have conversations about safety on on set and what does it mean, mean to have a safe production and how do we talk about diversity and how do we talk about um, the uncomfortable things that happen um, when we are bidding from the bid all the way through to the end so I'm pleased that both of you are here uh, that's it for me I'd love for Ahmad and Jill to introduce themselves and then we'll go and have um, do a really soft and quick introductions with Danny and Q before we get started um, I guess I'll go ahead and go first uh, so I am Jill Broussard and I am a commercial lifestyle photographer and I'm based in Dallas Texas and um, I've been in the Texas market for about 20 years. And so um, I was overjoyed to find that even though I was in Texas and there's no APA chapter specifically based here, that I could get involved um, through the diversity committee first. And then I got on to um, doing more work with the national board. And I love it because it's really helped me to find great relationships and feel more valued as a community instead of just like a one-off photographer, um, kind of like fighting for my space. And it's been really lovely, especially to get to have these conversations, um, just to feel like we can do better for more people and I can be part of a, a solution rather than a problem. So really glad to be here and I'm excited to see what Martine has um, in store for you guys. Um, so it's really nice to meet everybody and I'm glad to be here. Nice to meet you. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Ahmad Barber. I am one half of a photography duo by the name of ABDM Studio. Um, we are a fashion and lifestyle photography duo that focus mainly in the celebrity editorial space. Um, but we are now in many other spaces. Uh, but this is my first year as um, a national board member for APA as well as uh, the diversity committee. Um, again, echoing uh, Jill's point, we're just excited to do the work and excited to make impact in various spaces and just make sure that um, all people are really heard and have um, some of these solutions made available to them. So just excited to hear, you know, what we're all talking about today and just be part of the conversation. Awesome. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll go. Uh, you have to save that great deep voice for last cue. Um, so my name is Danny Jackson Smith, and um, my background is in the advertising and PR side of things. Um, spent many years as a producer, and now I run my own creative management agency called The Creators. Um, I manage a variety of artists, including production companies, photographers, some non traditional artists, like I have a solar artist. Um, along with muralists and things like that. So a sort of range of folks, which is a little bit non-traditional um, from this industry side of things, but I also find it to be um, sort of where I am and where the industry is going in terms of like a lot of people do different things, multi hyphenate type folks. So excited to be here because some of my favorite folks are photographers and the way that the stories are captured and the way that we're able to really represent the work, um, talk about the work, talk about the facets of the photography industry and ensuring that we do have that, you know, diversity and equity um, in those spaces, so. I'm Q, I'm the founder and executive producer of Curiosity Productions. So predominantly we sit in the traditional advertising commercial production company uh, space. However, very early on, I saw that there was going to be a need for a 360 view where it's video production, photography, editorial, as individual slices of advertising or as a combined thing uh, based on, you know, the way that advertising budgets work, right? Like clients want to bundle, they want efficiencies in what it is they're doing. And of course, getting involved in the industry as a whole, 
never anticipated that it would turn into um, this kind of life mission thing where it became super important for me to make sure that, you know, women, Black, Brown, LGBTQIA faces are seen and heard within the space. Um, you don't realize when you're showing up to what you think is something that's already existing and has an infrastructure that in this day and age, we'd still have such deficiency uh, when it comes to making sure that the underrepresented are actually represented in the space. So excited to be here. So Q, I realize I, um, your name sound very familiar. My agency had uh, a meeting with your agency. Um, I own, co-own a, uh, a advertising agency called Streamline Media and Communications. Yes. And we met with you earlier this year. Yes, you did. And okay, so funny. And then Jill, I'm sitting here and I'm like, I know your name. And then you worked on Rocket with us. So we hired you going down to Texas. So yes, lovely to see everyone. <laughs> Such a small world. I was I was really excited when I saw your name. I thought, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait when a minute. we were shutting down, literally, we shut down Abilene like it was a Universal Studios set. Literally. <laughs> Shut it down. I had corners insured for a million dollars. I remember that. I was like, what? They're like, you need a million dollars on this corner, a million dollars. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so good to see you. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, this industry, it's so small. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> right. All right. So well, here we go. Um, so just to recap what we're going to do today. Uh, we'll start with a general intro. It seems like all our tech works, so it's great. We'll do a general intro, then we'll jump into, um, <laughs> we'll do introductions again. Um, <clears throat> I'll do an intro about the uh, this uh, workshop, this seminar, as I don't quite know what to call it, I guess the series. Um, then uh, we'll I'll ask both of you to give me a bit of the more lengthy um, bio of yourselves, um, and then from there we will head into the questions about this uh, particular scope, which is what which we're calling um, creating change, building safe sets. I'm sorry, creating change. Um, building safe and collaborative spaces from start to finish. And in this case, it's going to be um, a producer and, and um, artist agent's perspective. Before we proceed, do the two of you have any questions? Are you guys ready for the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously I have, I, I said some of the questions that I'm going to ask today. The thing is that when you get into these conversations, there's just a chemistry and alchemy that happens. So I'm sure that both Ahmad and Jill might have some follow up thoughts to what it is that you might to your answers, in which case then, you know, they'll jump in and then I will jump in as well. But as of now, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so Ahmad and Jill, I'll both ask you, do you want me to have you introduce yourselves or do you want me to just say who you are and then you'll, <laughs> you'll wave? But what's your... You can say who I am and just... Go. Yeah. Okay. I feel like this is, you know, the... <laughs> um, what is it? The uh, Dancing with the Stars where the <laughs> yes you the guess they wave they're like hey yep yep all right so here we go hello everyone welcome to scope my name is martine severin and i am the chair of the apa diversity committee i'm a lifestyle photographer uh, based in chicago and i'm so pleased that you're here to this workshop creating change building safe and collaborative collaborative spaces from start to finish. Today, I have um, Kadri Holmes and Danny Jackson-Smith joining me as our guests. They're in the guest chair today. And I also have my esteemed colleagues, Ahmad Barber, as well as Jill Broussard, um, who are my on, on the diversity committee with me. 
And I'm so pleased to be to have them as well as to talk with both um, Q, as we call him, uh, as well as with Danny. So you may have caught the first two versions of this series that we are doing on creating safe spaces. So this workshop is really designed to facilitate meaningful discussions amongst talent, talent agents, producers, artists, reps, who are all in the photography industry. And this conversation offers a platform for the exchange of the best practices that thus enable us to address concerns and establish secure and collaborative collaborative spaces on set and in general um, as we're going about creating uh, work with from the bidding process all the way to the end. So before I begin, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the scope. So this episode of Scope is brought to you by the American Photographic Artists, the APA, and the APA Diversity Committee. APA is a not-for-profit organization for photographers who are primarily in the advertising, editorial, and commercial sectors. APA's mission is to help photographers succeed through the establishment of community, education, and advocacy. And as I mentioned, I am the chair of APA's Diversity Committee. So the series on scope is to help us understand and consider the challenges of our peers and find solutions for a better working environment. And to learn more about scope and about the diversity committee and to become a member of APA, please visit apanational.org for more information. So Q and Danny, I'm so pleased that you're joining me. I would love to start by asking you to um, give us a, a short bio of who you are and the work that you do. Um, Danny, we'd love to start with you. Awesome. Yeah, um, as said, my name is Danny Jackson Smith. Um, I run the company, The Creators, Creative Management Agency. I work with artists across the spectrum, including directors, photographers, um, some non traditional artists in the spaces of tech art. Um, I have a solar artist. Um, my background is in advertising and PR, so worked at big agencies for quite a while. And that's sort of how I fell in love with working with artists and working with creatives and decided to step onto this side to be an advocate um, on behalf of, of the artists and, the, and the, you know, the craft that I love. So excited to be here and hold this conversation. Well, Q, I, I think in. you're next. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I'll hop in. So I'm Q. I'm the founder and executive producer of Curiosity Productions. So our main office is in Chicago, then we have an LA satellite as well. Uh, we are focused on video production, post-production and photography. Um, I believe I mentioned a little bit earlier that you know we kind of let the market tell us who we need it to be. Um, so originally starting out in the video side and then they're like, can you edit? Then we went into edit and then they're like, can you do photography? And it was nice because some clients still come to us for like the 360 view. Um, and then there are other clients that just come to us for one slice of that pie. We've worked with so many major brands around the country. Uh, we've shot both domestically as well as internationally. Uh, we represent artists, women, LGBTQIA, Black, Hispanic, like which is amazing. Uh, because as I continue to have conversations, of course, in this space, I'm always asked that question. Do you have Black directors? Do you have Black editors? Do you have you know, Black uh, photographers in the mix as well. Um, because as everyone knows, you know, who's watching or anyone who's on this call, we all know that, you know, we've been fairly underrepresented in this space. And it's something that we still struggle with, you know, despite the atrocities of what we continue to see happening, you know, in our own country. So I love having a platform to be an advocate for change. Um, so as they say, be the change you want to see. Um, and so that's what I hope I'm doing with the platform. So delighted to be here. We're pleased to have both you and Danny Q. Thank you. All right. So in your field, you've had experiences where by managing photographers and managing client relationships, you've had people potentially feel unsafe on the job or on the set. Could you talk to me a little bit about what some of those situations have been? Um, 
I'll start. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I will get very specific. Um, I was on a project once and, um, you know, we're doing fittings and I'm doing my thing. And apparently while I had walked away, um, there was a creative who commented that one of our talent looked like a very derogatory word used to describe a person who's gay. And this talent was a child. Um, I did not hear um, this term used. And so we continued with the production. Fast forward, um, you know, we're back in the office and this creative is at the office. And he says to me, I was told to apologize to you. And I said, okay, for, for what? And he explained to me what he had said. And I remember thinking, you know, in that moment, like, you know, obviously I'm gay. I stand on that platform and I'm proud to be gay. But not only was the word used, but it was used in describing what a child was wearing. Um, and again, as a producer, not as an artist in that moment, you know, I accepted his apology, of course. We continued on, you know, with the project and with the process. But I got to be honest, I was shocked that this creative did not get fired and lose his job. Um, and that person continues to work to this day. Um, so I think sharing stories, you know, or things that you're asking us to share is our way of making sure that people know we don't think it's cool when people do things like that. Um, and that is, unfortunately, some of the behavior that we see, you know, within the sector of our industry. And that one wasn't about race. That was about, you know, gender and sexuality. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm not surprised that the person is not let go. Um, it's just uh, the incident that I can, one of the incidents I can recall, it was um, actually the client that said something inappropriate um, and it was racially driven. Um, it was about the complexion of the um, of the talent, and it was an international project. Um, this comment was heard by our creative team. The creative team was very offended, right? Because we had a, a diverse creative team, um, and the conversation went internally. Um, and it didn't really go anywhere because then the conversation becomes about offending the client. Um, I've I've had I've had another situation that was a little bit similar to that where um actually this one wasn't wasn't me personally, but was it was iterated to me where um I have a I have a colleague who was in a meeting where um the the client I guess maybe thought they were on mute or something and used the n word, um and that did escalate to a larger conversation, um in that person's instance. But there was also this mixed bag of things where, you know, redirecting the client to speak directly to the person, uh, which then again puts the pressure back on the individual versus. Um, the company standing up for that individual in the ethos, right? So I think in a lot of the experiences that I've seen, um, and this is not always, um, this is, the, you know, we, we just have to continue to advocate for each other. But some of the things I've heard and some of the things that I've experienced, um, it the pressure comes on the person, on the individual who would likely be offended to advocate for themselves and advocate for the well-being uh, and the learning in that moment, right? And which is a pretty heavy load. So, you know, I think that's a space that we definitely have to think about when we think about our wellness and our mindfulness, right? Because it shouldn't be on us to teach people how to be better people. Um, but a lot of times, I'm saying us as a global us, you know, regardless of whatever the... Um, diversity sector is, you know, uh, it, it could be in different forms, but um, that's what I've seen. And that's, that's not very uplifting or encouraging. <laughs> um, I, I have been able to, in some of these instances, you know, go to head of diversity teams and talk to people and things of that nature. But um, again, it's still a lot of legwork 
on the people who are diverse. Um, so my request, right, to us as an industry, uh, regardless of if you're on the client side, on the agency side, or um, working on set as, um, you know, leading a photography shoot as, the, as a photographer, um, is to find ways to be more transparent, to have these honest conversations, and to advocate for each other in the space. And so I, I will say that's something that I have found very important to do is if I see something, say something and find the, the key people to try to navigate the conversation so that um, we aren't going at it alone. Annie, that's a really great segue for my next question, which is um, obviously we all have different definitions of what safety is and what safe sets look like. From your perspective, could you talk a little bit about um, what it means to you? What safe sets mean to you? Aside from the the physical aspect of it in terms of making Yeah, sure. I was like, no weapons. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we're talking about is, a, is the belonging aspect, right? Where there is um, not only a diverse group of people, an inclusive environment, but also a welcoming environment that provides a, you know, this sense of we're all here together, right? Um, and we know how it goes. It's production. Sometimes your best friends on set and on production, and then like a month later, you're like, like nobody's talking to each other, but you're just best friends on set. But while we're on set, we do want to foster that. I'll say like cue sets are always great. As a producer, I've, I, I'm always like, can we need to do it like curiosity productions please like um and it's because everyone is friendly and welcoming and the food is always fantastic thank you so food is always a great way to make people bond but to to just bring it on back safety is that sense of belonging and making sure that there aren't people sitting off in the corner by themselves um making sure that we're like visually paying attention to what's going on with people right like how is this person's health um, are they, how, how do they mentally look? How do they physically look when you're, when you're looking at them? Because people aren't always sharing when they're um, afraid or unsafe or something like that. So, and the other part I think is, is the policing of, um, I shouldn't say policing, but being present to what we say, because sometimes we're not really present to where our biases are. And so, if someone says something that is inappropriate, addressing it so that we can all move on as a group um, or finding some way to, you know, um, bridge the, bridge any gaps, right? Because we aren't perfect. We are human, but we have to um, step up and be responsible as possible. Well, I'll double down on that. I like to have fun on set, right? If it's not fun, it's no good. Um, so just making sure that the environment is a happy environment to spark creativity. Um, but to Danny's point as well, just being aware, right? It's not just about race. It's not just about sexuality or comments in those sectors. I also find like even socioeconomic things, right? When you're sitting on set and you may have someone who's starting out for the first time and, you know, I'm guilty of being that person who will say, Let's bring on someone who has no experience, right, to give them an opportunity, especially when it's in the diversity space. And oftentimes I've had to remind people, you may have, you know, a video village or, you know, everyone around the uh, Digitech computer looking at the screen, looking at the images. And this one's talking about, oh, I'm headed to Vail. And this one, oh, I just got back from Cannes. And, you know, just things that some people can't fathom um, and just having that awareness similar to what Danny said of what you actually are saying and how that all may impact other people. Um, because I think there are times that some of the behavior becomes somewhat elitist and making sure that, you know, you're keeping a level head and realizing, although production feels like the wild, wild west, right? It's like, we're in the wild, wild west. We can do whatever we want. At the end of the day, it's still business. And, you know, I often like to remind people the IRS comes after us the same way. And the federal, you know, employment laws also come after us the same way as well. So being mindful, you know, of just following the law um, and making sure that people understand, you know, when what they're doing or saying teeters on being borderline unlawful 
Um, I think that's something that we forget. It's kind of like when people call and they're like, hey, we want to do this project. And, you know, you have to say to them, they're like, can we get a deal? Can we get a deal? And I have to say things like, you're not even paying minimum wage. So you're breaking the law, right? So just being mindful of some of that stuff as well. Yeah, don't be inappropriate. <laughs> it's out of mind. Is one thing, right? Yeah. And have fun as much as you can. Um, my next question for you is how do you set a photographer up? I guess in some ways this is a great question for you, Danny. How do you set a photographer up your or your artist up for success through managing the client um in cre in creative relationship? Um, right from the beginning. Can you share some things that you may you may do to shepherd them through the process? Yeah, um, I'm like the magic cloak, right? You know, like Superman, I got that cape, I'm the cape, you know. Um, I'm the separation, the buffer between the um, photographer and the client, right? So really working with the client to understand what they need, what they mean, what their specific deliverables are, you know, and, and I know this sounds like duh, maybe for a lot of people, maybe not, I don't know, but um, a big part of it is trying to avoid the runaround, right? And really getting to um, express how beautiful the work is. So I get to share the work with, you know, creatives. I get to talk about it in, in several meetings and get people all excited. So I'm the cheerleader and I'm the protector and I'm the enforcer. <laughs> right so where is the check <laughs> that's my job oh my gosh you're gonna love this work that's my job too um and then just the the the, the buffer is really in that back and forth because you know we are still dealing with um humans right and as Erica Badu said keep in mind I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my stuff right <laughs> so um I, I think that although we're making work for clients, um, there still is a connection to the work and being able to help buffer what some of those, some of that feedback is and how, how we can get the best result on both sides. That's my job. Well, I'll, you know, piggyback on that as well. Like we are <laughs> the mouthpiece, you know, that surrounds the artist. And, you know, I was with clients in LA last week and someone said, oh, what do you love and what do you hate about your job? And I remember saying, the best part of my job is calling the artists to tell them you got the job, right? Like they want you. That's like the best part. The crappiest part of the job is calling the artists and saying you are not getting the job. You know, I've told them I had, you know, I've had grown men cry. You know, you've seen uh, the desperation of life and, you know, just circumstance in these conversations. So it truly is a relationship of trust, right? It's almost like you have multiple business partners that are looking to you to help guide them. Um, and I will also say listening. Uh, you would be surprised. You know, we get on a lot of different calls talking to a lot of agencies and creative teams. And my job is always listening uh, because many times artists, you know, they're so excited to be there and be in the moment and they're already in their head executing and like, what's this cool thing we can do? And what's that cool thing? And you actually need someone who's there listening. So when it comes time to put together pitch decks and treatments that are going to go back to creative teams, I find myself a lot going, they said, no boring gardening. Why are we doing boring gardening? Or, you know, just the little nuances that you know, some people just simply don't hear, you know, in the excitement of, hey, I'm going to do the job. And I will take it a step further, um, specifically with my artists of color, there definitely is a difference. Um, and I will say that the difference is, is my desire to see them su succeed. I can tell you that I do see a difference in the way that an agency engages with a woman versus a diverse artist versus a white cis male artist, right? Uh, certain things are more forgiving for others than they are for others, right? In those conversations. And I even had to take it a step further and have conversations about pay equity, right? And do we pay diverse artists, right? Less than what we will pay a standard, regular, you know, general market white artist. 
um, which are obviously uncomfortable conversations to have, but that's my job, right? That's our job is to advocate on behalf of and make sure that people understand the value, right? That those artists bring into the situation. Well, Q, I have to ask for more specifics, especially since you said you love to give details. I'd yes. love to hear a bit more about what are some of the differences you see versus how all those three different uh, people from different uh, backgrounds how, you mentioned how, get how much treated. How much time do you have? Do we have? We enough? have all the time in the world. So <laughs> I will actually give you a real story. So I, sure. and this is recent, and like talk about made my skin boil. Um, I recently had an artist that was, a client was interested in working with him for a job. He's a diverse artist. And we had gone around about what time can we do the call? What time can we do the call? Kind of rearranging schedule. And unfortunately, in the situation, the client said, you know what, we're going to change when this needs to happen. We need to pivot, which happens, right? So we're going to just go ahead and go with the person that we worked with last time on this project. So I get that things happen. So I called the uh, producer on the agency side that was responsible for this job. And I said, you know, I'm a true believer in the value of people's time, right? And of artists and their time. And I said, and specifically when it comes to the artists of color, you know, I want to make sure that they are given every opportunity that they can. And so clearly there was something in the work that you saw um, or that your creative team saw in their work. And I would love the opportunity to get this artist in front of them just to say hello, even though it won't work out on this one. And the response I got was, this is the most aggressive sales pitch I've ever received in my life. And when you talk about skin boiling on me, and I said, I don't know what's aggressive about it because this is my real life. And, you know, like this is, and, it, and I, as I said to this producer, I've had similar situations happen. I've worked with other agencies and their response back to me was, absolutely, that's a great idea, right? You know, like didn't work out on this one, let's figure it out. So going into some of these situations, you have to realize whether we like it or not, people have internal biases, right? That are things that they cannot get around or get over. And so then this person decided to double down and tell me about anti-Semitic comments that she'd received in her life. And in that moment, I'm like, we're, we're going off the rails and these are two very different conversations, right? All I'm asking was for an artist of color to get on the phone with your creative team and it went down like some path. And then by the end of it, I kind of got off the phone and I was like, how did I turn from trying to represent my artists, right? And give them an opportunity into now I've hurt your feelings, which I don't give a damn about hurting anyone's feelings um, to, you know, now you're the victim. And it was just like, wow, like when people have things, right, or these things that they've learned or have been taught, the manipulation and the systematic maneuvering or the shuck and jive and the weaving to get what they want happens very strongly. And ironically, this person promised me in the end, oh, yeah, I'll do it. And do you think it ever got done? No. And I wasn't counting on it actually getting done because I knew it wouldn't, right? And so for me, my protection then of my artists, I was very clear with uh, my reps that represent the company. If that agency does call, we're simply not interested because they don't share the same core values that we have when it comes to how you treat people, period. And then take it a step further when it comes to artists of color and their treatment. And mind you, the project that you know we were getting involved in was a project really that could not afford this artist. And, and the example that I got, it was just very convoluted, but the example I got was, oh, I made this artist famous and gave them their first chance. And this happened to be a Black artist as well. And I'm like, what does this have to do with it's simply not getting on a call to have a conversation with a creative team? So, you know, a lot of that, I really do try to shield artists from because, you know, like Danny said, the Erica Badu comment, like people are very sensitive and 
hey, that may be a bad apple within an organization, but not every person within that organization is a bad apple, right? And you don't want someone to make an emotional decision about how they're going to move forward or who they would work with or not work with when ultimately that's one person out of, you know, maybe 30 people that have the opportunity to potentially work with this artist. I could keep going, but I'll, <laughs> I'll just oh, leave thank you, you. With that one. I'll just leave you with that one. Um, I guess one of the from both of your responses, one of the things I'm curious about is um how you coach or if you've coached photographers in the past to speak up for themselves. And if so, what kind of, can you give us some examples and some tools that you've shared from your tool belt to help them be able to have some of these tough conversations when they happen around safety? Well, I think each artist is different, right? And so where one artist is like a hyper creative that you're like, oh my God, you should never talk, but you're brilliant, right? <laughs> like there, That exists then you have others who are just natural born salespeople. They can get on calls and maneuver and navigate. And again, I think that's part of our job is figuring out who they are, right? And where they fit into the lineup. Um, it's our job to sell the persona, right? Of who they are and represent their work uh, back to those that are interested in buying. And I always say to them, by the time we get to the call, you must take over, like you must take it. You know, when when we're in the sales process or pitch and all of that, when we get to the call to actually have the conversation with the creatives, they need to see you shine. Um, and I, I, I will be very honest, for the most part, I tend to take on that role because I do feel like it's like when you get on a call and they're like, let's just talk creative. Let's not talk production, you know, or let's talk creative. Let's not talk about the logistics and, and those kinds of things. So for me personally, in my own style, I like to keep creatives involved with creative and I like to keep the business involved with business. Um, if there is, I would argue that if there is something that is happening on a set when we're physically there on the day, that is not great. Um, again, depending on the personality of the artist, they're going to say something or not, but I definitely prefer that they come to me so that we can kind of troubleshoot whatever the issue is together um, to navigate because as you know, you know, Literally, I may have the nuances to the politics or who doesn't like who or who doesn't jive with who, you know, kind of behind the scenes um, to make the situation go better because handled the wrong way, those situations blow up even more um, and turn into nightmares that obviously no one wants to be dealing with. Yeah, I agree with what Q was saying here. Um you know, when it comes to the initial, you know, intro conversations and all of that, I'm very much involved. I'm also very much involved for some of the artists that I work with um, in navigating through how the creative connects to the production, connects to the budget, you know, you know, just connecting the dots in some ways. Um, but that still becomes more of a production conversation and less of a, of a strictly creative conversation. Now, we riff in the background right on like how to elevate the creative and how to position things based on feedback similar to like what Q was saying like I'm listening for those nuances of how will this best work for the brand or how should we show up and things of that nature um, and so supporting in that type of way so that they can present the best creative in the most connected coherent way um, but the artistry of it I try not to you know, be overbearing, you know, they are their own butterflies. Um, but what I will say is like, when it comes to set and any, any level of uncomfort, um, I try to, you know, continue to build that trust so that they will talk to me so that I can navigate the conversation. I recently had a, you know, this isn't a, this is like a safety thing, but, you know, people are trying new models with like what best works at, you know, their agency. And I've seen a couple of models where um, all the creatives that are considered for a project are kind of put together in the same space, which kind of makes it a little bit odd in terms of like idea sharing and um, 
where the ideas come from and you know just having a creative be able to say to me like hey I'm I'm not really comfortable in this scenario and then to be able to navigate that so like to Q's point something like that could be very uncomfortable it could go wrong um it could blow up but just having someone to advocate on your behalf is um important in terms of safety on set and how to speak up for yourself on set I think it takes practice just like with any job or with anything that you're doing. But if you see something that is not right, right? Not not like not only for the environment, but also not right for what you're shooting, right? So, you know, if it's offensive or inappropriate, that's one thing. If it's just off brand, that's another thing. You know what I mean? Like, but but at that point, the creative is in the driver's seat and and I'm kind of in the background watching. If I see something, I'm I might, you know, go over and do a tap and say, hey, I'm I'm noticing something. But I also want to empower the creative to be present to that, especially when it's in the work. You know what I mean? Um, especially because as a rep now, as a producer, I'm in the room all the time. But as a rep, I'm not always in that room. And so um you know, we have those conversations ahead of time just to say like, hey, if you if you feel anything, just give me a quick shout, give me a call. Um, but I think it's important for people to practice, right? And and it is it is essentially a practice of when you see something, say something, because at the end of the day, your name is on that work. You know, like you're going to put out work and if somebody's I had a, a situation one time where inadvertently someone was trying to have a Latina girl put a pineapple on her head because this is like all about fruit and food and having fun. And I was like, hey, listen, I, you know, I know that sounds cool to you, but we cannot have her with a pineapple on her head um, because that could feel like a Chiquita banana situation. It just doesn't feel quite right. Um, and if I didn't say anything, that could have just gone across the board and that could have been very stereotypical or just just off the rails, right? Um, you're in the room for a reason. And that's what we have to continue to empower ourselves to understand that you have a voice, you're in the room for a reason and your perspective is important. I agree. I'm gonna, I'll share a story. I had a similar situation. We were doing a photography shoot. A uh, young black girl comes out and, you know, everyone's there and, on their computers and laptops and chatting back and forth. And I look at the monitor and her hair looked a hot mess. I mean, it wasn't just a little hot mess, like it was a big hot mess. And I said, we have to stop. I go, she needs to go back. Someone, you know, like, cause everyone else was fine with it. And what I explained to everyone, I said, you will not have on a shoot that I'm doing Black mothers calling this out when we are a Black-owned production company. We won't have that. And of course, she went back. They added some little curls. She came back. She looked amazing. And everyone's like, oh, my God, she does look better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like little nuances like that. And I think this is why it's so important to have representative faces and representative people in the room. Because what if I had not been there in that moment? What would that have looked like for that to go out there? You know what I mean? Like that would have been awful. But, yeah. you know, as we see in so many, you know, pieces and news coverage, crazy things happen all the time. So that was kind of one of the really cool things that I realized with my role, you know, as a company owner, to Danny's point, you know, you have a voice. Like, you know, you can say something. And if I am one of the curators of who we are, and what we do in this time frame, prior to dying some years from now, I want to make sure that how I represent our culture, you know, lights up the system in a positive way, so that when people look at the work that we created, they'll say, holy shit, you know, like, that's what it was like in 2023, you know, not like, ooh, what were they doing in 2023, <laughs> you know, so. Exactly, because we can look back at work, and you can see the trends of you know, racism, sexism, all of those things in actual advertising, right? Or in in our branded spaces. And so we don't want to be a part of that legacy. We want to create new legacies. Agreed. Oh gosh. Um, 
before I move on, uh, Ahmad and Jill, do you have anything? Do you want to pop in to say anything? I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Danny and, and Hugh actually mentioned this too. You talked about just the idea of one, diverse people not having the responsibility to kind of like teach people. But when you think about that from a larger, larger sense, a lot of people talk about that as in relation to like cancel culture, zero, zero tolerance policies, and how they kind of remove the opportunity for some people to kind of learn for their mistakes. Um, do you think it's better to create spaces of awareness where situations may happen and those people involved can kind of like have their moment, learn from their mistakes, be taught whatever it may have you, or should they be removed and have that responsibility be placed on them in those instances to kind of learn and figure things out? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to be mindful of repeat offenders, right? So I think that... Um, I've definitely known people that are so privileged that they're just not present. I think all of us in our own different ways have levels of privilege where we where we're not present, right? Like I don't have a um a disability that impairs me walking up and down the street. Just had this conversation with my friend who um he broke his foot and he was like, I thought I was an advocate you know, for people with disabilities until now I have a broken foot and I'm like, that stair is too high. That curb is too far away. You know what I mean? So I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of things that we're not present to based on our different levels of privilege. With that being said, I think that we all must be responsible for our words and our actions. Right. And so you may get a, um, if this is in a workplace, you you may get a, a, a conversation initially, right? This is a first incident. This is a conversation. Guys, we have to pay attention. This is what we need to be present to. After that conversation, there has to be some sort of accountability process in place. Um, because otherwise, we're not changing the culture. We're making excuses and exceptions, right? And so I'm not a person to say like, you did this thing one time, you canceled. But like, if you're racist, keep that stuff at home. Put it in your back pocket and keep it to yourself. Um, because the space that we're creating at work and in the workplace and on set is an inclusive space. If you happen to put that stuff on social media and you get fired, that's you. I'm not, I don't feel bad for you. You know what I mean? Because at that point, when we speak, when we're on this panel, we're speaking on behalf of our own companies. If we were at Facebook or any other company, we're then speaking on behalf of the of our, our companies. You're always in representation. Your social media is not your diary. It is a publication. Although a privately owned publication is still a publication that goes out to the masses. So um, those of us in media should be way more aware of that. Those of us that we work in this industry, we should be very clear on what these channels do. So um, I do think there should be safe spaces for people to learn. I do not think that um, diverse people across the spectrum should be, should have to be the teachers, right? There are enough books, there are enough resources um, in place where we should be encouraging people to do some self-learning and some self-discovery because as Q said, like this is this is ingrained in people. If you have a bias, the bias didn't just pop up yesterday. The bias has been conditioned in you. And so it's gonna take a while for you to uncondition your conditioning, right? And so I may have a conversation with you, but you have to keep it up to just like going to the gym in order to be in your best um, emotional fitness, emotional intelligence fitness. So sorry if that was like really convoluted, but not that sorry, because this, this is an onion, right? Like we're talking about people, we're talking about emotions, we're talking about systems, and um, this will take a, a bit of time to continue to unpack. But while the time is ticking, I don't want time to be an excuse for us to make progress, right? So that's why I'm saying you get a talking to, but our companies we have to put an expectation that there are repercussions to some actions right well i tell people now i don't want allies like i'm done with allies because allies sit back and they just watch us right and they're like but i support you 
I said, I want accessories to the fact. Go commit a crime with me, right? Be so committed to the change that we actually make it happen. Um, I'm of the mindset, I have personally, I'm a no tolerance kind of a person. Um, I get that it takes time to change things, but being black and culturally black and, you know, growing up black, we are taught what that feels like when you are driving near a police officer on a street and they're going up and on the side of you and doing the whole thing. Right. We all know what that looks like if you are culture, if you are black. Right. So the same way I learn that and learn how I have to navigate through life, right, by my parents, I would hope that those that are coming from a privileged standpoint have been taught the same thing. And so where in the work, which we know that's not necessarily the case, but where in the workplace is it to the expense of a company that they teach you on how to be a good person, right? But if I were to ask you to hire a minority-owned company or a minority photographer, minority director and editor, we can come up with all the excuses in the world until there's compensation tied to you actually making the change. So I would say historically, the way we've seen racism eradicate itself, unfortunately, has been by financial gain, which has kept the majority or the uh, majority continuing to have the majority. But that has systematically been the thing that has changed some of these systems. Um, because you offend once, you usually offend again. Um, and, you know, some of it, I get not one size fits all, but it's nuance, right? Like, I often say to people when describing what someone doesn't like someone touching them or, you know, someone said a comment, I always say, for you, this may have been a level three. For that person, this is a level 10. So as a result of that, anything you do should be at a level one, right? Because you never know, based on anyone's life experience, what number, you know, your action is going to create and or trigger for them. I don't have an answer. And Siri says, I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, Siri doesn't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, 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 I'm sorry, I just had it like, what you're saying makes so much sense, Q. It is it is very nuanced. I guess in my my mind, I am thinking about these people that um are privileged but just aren't present. Like they're not even racist, they're just not present. You know what I mean? And so I've had to have several conversations with people about like, I mean, think about the conversation. I, I mean, even within my family, right? Like people were accustomed to saying things about, you know, the gay community, the trans community. And you have to wake them up. This yeah. is a 1990. Wake up. You know what I mean? And so, you know, the thing that was funny five years ago, 10 years ago, isn't funny right now. Right. You know what I mean? Um, and the thing that you didn't even think two shakes about being a joke, you know what I mean? Or like a guy hitting a lady on the butt or not asking if they can go in for the kiss. Now it's like, whoa, 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 whoa buddy. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's it's these things that I think are privileged. Um, and not having to address certain things. Like you said, like if you're driving and the cops are behind you, you're very present to that. There are mm -hmm. a lot of people that don't have to be present to that at all. They're just they're just going 90 or 100 or whatever. You know what I mean? They're blowing the speed limit and not considering it at all. So, um, but I do think if it's like malicious or nasty or you can prove it, you know what I mean? Like I, I do think that there are some cutoff points, right? But I think this is what where it is a spectrum, you know, I, and I, I love that analogy you made about your three might be somebody else's 10 and, mm -hmm. and having to really explain that to people. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much for answering that. Of course. <laughs> I was going to say thanks a lot for that question. Um, so in some ways, we've covered this question I'm going to ask, but I'll pose it anyway. Um, and it's essentially switching or continuing the conversation to talk about tokenism, um, specifically tokeniz tokenization, tokenization and objectification um, with and around inclusion, because I think that sometimes um, the idea of, of creating um, safe spaces and creating, um, having 
diversity can be really performative rather than um, than anything else. And so I just would love for you to talk about how, um, or even share some tips for, for artists, for photographers who often are kind of trying to walk that walk to figure out, you know, hey, what's going on? Or even on set as they are um, noticing tokenization happening, um, how do they handle uh, this when they see it? Well, I, I experience it every day. <laughs> um, this is just a real reality. Um, we're in a phase, especially with the business, where people are contacting us because we're a minority-owned business so that they can check a box back to their client, right? And say, oh, we reached out to a minority-owned business. You know, this is what it is, but we're going to go with Joe Blow or maybe it is Q, right? So that tokenism, unfortunately, while we try to navigate how to get out what we, what none of us, right, in this group here created, right? We didn't create it. We were just born into it. Um, you're going to see a lot of that. So what I often say to the artists that, you know, work with me, you need to make sure that you are coming to the table with a solid perspective. You know, no one wants to be hired because of the color of their skin or because of their gender or sexuality. You want to be hired because someone appreciates your work. They appreciate what you bring to the table and they understand, right, what sets you aside, you know, from anyone else. And I think with diversity mandates, you know, there are benefits and, you know, pros and cons, I should say to it, where on one side, it's great because you're giving opportunity that otherwise clearly would never happen. Uh, because when you go back and forth with some of the creative teams, they're still resistant, right? They're still like, well, I don't know. We kind of got to go do this minority thing or this gay company thing. So there's still resistance there. Um, and I feel like that resistance comes as a result of everyone looking at D DEI as like the separate thing when DEI actually needs to be integrated into the process, right? Into the creative process. I would also argue that a lot of the tokenism happens because on the brand side, prior to getting to agency, prior to getting to, you know, vendors, your own companies are not diverse. So you're not doing the right things at the top of the food chain. And therefore, the only thing we know are systems that kind of continue to perpetuate um, the behavior and I would challenge brands to actually get more diverse and respect the fact that consumers of all race, races and all genders and sexual orientation purchase their products, right? And I would love to see more brands putting a stance with it, um, despite all the lawsuits that are happening out there against equity and inclusion programs at brands and at companies to really say, no, we're going to change this. We're going to make this right. Because oftentimes when someone's wanting to actually engage with me, there's usually someone who's black. It's a black CMO or it's a black agency producer or it's a black creative at the agency. So there always seems to be a cultural through line um, and good, better, and different. People like to work with people they understand and they know are going to understand their communication language as well. Um, so I think it starts at the top to help us avoid it, you know, as you go down. Another onion of a question. It's an onion. <laughs> um, there isn't an industry out here that you can name that you can say on the business side is as diversified as it needs to be, is as inclusive as it needs to be or has a proper sense of belonging. I don't think you can say um, any one industry has it rolled out. And if you find a company that is doing it right or near right, um, there'll be other things, right? So I don't think there's perfection, but I do think that when it comes to this tokenism piece of it, I think what Q is talking about, especially in that bidding process of, you know, you, you're calling this person just because they're diverse um, and the propensity to not go with that person, like it's just a check mark, it's just a check bid. Um, it's very disgusting and it's a waste of time and a waste of money. Um, and so for the creatives um, and for the companies that are 
experiencing this, I think it's cute. Like the example you gave earlier of, of just saying, you know what? I mean, it wasn't the same thing about a check bid, but the experience was not good. Like, okay. And I've heard other people say this, like, we will not be bidding with this company again. Yeah. Because there is, this is clearly a, uh, a habit forming, like this has happened maybe more than once. We know you're only calling because you, you're just filling in a blank for that call. But I will say, if you get the call, regardless of how you got the call, blow it out of the water. Exactly. Kick on the door, wave in the forefront. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like you gotta like be amazing. And um and it's important because it, it's not always like how you got there, it's what you do when you're there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and so think about that seat at the table analogy. It's the it's the seat at the table. It, you know, honestly, sometimes I look at it like this, like it's like, okay, somebody was gonna try to use me. I need to figure out what is the gain for me in this? What is the win-win? And if I can't create a win-win, then I don't need to do it, right? Um, there are a lot of people that were the first to do something. There are a lot of people, <laughs> um, there are a lot of people that have the, um, have diverse titles and they're also being attacked right now. Like, oh, your job isn't really that important. Attacked on both sides, right? Attacked from people of color that are like, this is just a token job and attacked by um, the industry that doesn't want you to have this anyway to diversify the industry. Um, however you got there, be amazing. I've had people invite me to rooms just because I was a woman. I've had people invite me to rooms because I, they thought I looked pretty. Um, and I'm on my mission. Like, I don't have to entertain why you brought me in this room, but I'm in this room now. And I'm supposed to be here. So let me do my job. You know, sit down. This is my <laughs> time. So I think, but we have to give this energy to each other. You don't know how many days I call Q. And I'm like, Q, <laughs> I'm stepping into this meeting. <laughs> and then Q becomes my cheerleader. So our network Vice versa. is very important. It's, 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 it's vital. And so, it you know, even from a, like we were just talking about because there was a black producer or because there was a black CMO, these people are still in non-diverse spaces. So they're standing alone a lot of times. So I always tell people we need people at every level. I need you in that corporate office so you can call me and then I can call so-and-so and, and then so-and-so can call the next so-and-so because we're building a network and it's not nepotism when you're actually qualified for the job, when you're actually opening up to say, hey, um, we're sending in a slate of applications. Now at least half of that slate is diverse. Oh, we're 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 setting up our next set of um directors reels for consideration. Okay, now those considerations are diverse. We have a amazing opportunity for photographers. Let's get some diverse considerations. It's the consideration. We haven't even been getting authentic consideration. And I think that's a massive, like that's a massive issue, right? And so we get the consideration and then we have to get the decision makers in place. And so we really, we have to advocate for each other, support each other. And then as decision makers, um, we have to give back as we climb. I mean, that like we, we own companies. I could be doing something else with my time. I could just be painting on the wall somewhere, but I am um, dedicated to advocating for diverse creatives in this space. I, I also want to say something on this topic because someone brought this up uh, when I was in New York and it was a panel and they're like, you have to remember, and this is a message to those that are diverse that are going to be watching this, just because someone else is diverse and they are in a position of power does not mean that person gives a damn about you. Mm -hmm. I repeat, <laughs> just because that person is diverse does not mean that they give a damn about you. So what that means is there are some people that exist within the space that may look like you, but don't share the same values as you, right? Perhaps their whole goal is to keep their six-figure income, right? And to go with the flow until it's time for them to retire. Um, and I think, you know, as minorities, and again, this is culturally ingrained into many of us, like, oh, we help each other. Don't expect that that is necessarily going to be the case. 
at the end of the day, your work, your reputation um, has to be what drives you into these conversations. And when you are there, you have to show up and show out, period. Okay, 100% what Q is saying. And for those people, you know who you are. You get to the top, you didn't close the door already. Man, <laughs> sometimes we get into positions and because we haven't built community along the way, it's too late. You don't have any support at that point or you're living in your own fear, right? Because you're conditioned in this industry that I literally, as a producer, I was told by someone, don't be the black producer hiring all the black people because you don't want to come off that way. So when you're in, when you're welcomed into an industry and being told to exclude or put to the side who you are, who you may want to recommend uh, because of their ethnicity, and you're of that ethnicity, it's a conditioning, right? It's from the top. My encouragement to us that do get steps in because you know honestly, someone always brings you in. No, nobody gets anywhere completely alone, right? Is even if you see other people that are diverse closing doors create pathways and for those of us that create pathways we understand that the quality of the work has to be impeccable and so you don't just let every Tom Dick and Harry in just because of their skin tone or because of their you know because they're you know um, because they resonate with something that you are right? You, you, you do have to look at the work. And so it is a balance. It is a balance. And we have to teach each other. I think that's the other portion of it, right? Like, so looking at your um, portfolio and getting real feedback, Q will give some real feedback. He, if, it's, if it's sloppy, if it's ugly, if the lighting is off, don't think you're going to get a thumbs up from that guy. No, you won't. But what you will get is a lesson that helps you to be better for when you pitch the next time. And I think that's what we should be doing. Iron should be sharpening iron. And I, I love that analogy because we are sometimes delusional, right? Like we are. And the worst situation, and, and I had a situation actually recently with a new artist, like director of color, amazing but not understanding the nuances of how agency world works. And sometimes we are a little delusional in thinking that, no, 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 they love me. They love me. I'm the best. But you have to take your work. And I wish if there's anything we could do to like shift the narrative is actually sitting down, you know, and looking at the work so that people can see Joe's stuff is way better than Michael's stuff who's way better than Sally's stuff, you know, and actually compare the work and find out what it actually means to have better work or what makes that work better. Because this delusional thing of, you know, I'm the bouncer guy at the bar that takes photos. And now I think I'm going to be shooting a McDonald's ad is not, you know what I mean? Is not reality. Um, and there are people who every day make their way into the conversation and unfortunately, that then becomes the example of, right, to those that are on the buying and the hiring side of the business. And now we're all judged based on one person who walked in with, you know, the bar photos or, or what have you. So I think, you know, having honest conversations about what does good work look like, there's enough business globally to go around, right? So if you're, you know, because there are others who will come back and be like, well, if I give my tips away, they're going to get my jobs or there's enough work to go around, but we are no good if we cannot help each other to step it up and ensure that the work is what it needs to be and looks a part that actually empowers us forward, right? Versus backward. I feel like this conversation gave me a calendar's worth of like, of quotes. You, you two, <laughs> there's a calendar's worth of quotes that we could put together to keep people going through the the dark times um i wanted to do a time check for both um uq and danny uh, particularly since we're just we're sh a smidge bit over um jill has one last question for you for for you if you are open to taking it otherwise then 
We're just pleased Jill, to have Let's have go. A chance let's to talk go, about. Jill. Let's okay, go. Jill, go ahead and do it. Well, you know, I was just wondering on the subject of um, protecting your artists and looking out for them. Has there ever been a time when you've had to go back after the fact and address something that you learned about had happened on set, or if there was ever anything you had to do post shoot and how you handled that? And if any, you could give any examples of that. On the artist side, like I had to talk to the artist or I had to talk back to the client. Honestly, so either one, e either one, because they both have a propensity for, for learning. I have an example from a, from being a producer, but not from I, I I've had goodness fingers crossed <laughs> I've had pretty good experiences so far on the representation side, so I haven't had any craziness. Um, but um, as a as a producer, I've experienced um, goodness from the pitching process all the way through actual production, just the oddities of people you know, where you'd be with a creative and they'll they'll be in front of the artist and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I love you. You're so amazing. And then like we step out and they're like, I fucking hated that. I'm sorry, I used a bad word. But like, <laughs> this is like real life. <laughs> and I'm always like, who are you, Jekyll and Hyde person? Like, I don't even know how to live a life this way. But um those experiences are, are really something where you do have to sort of protect the artists and you, you have to let people know, like, this is still a job. This isn't your best friend. Like just because they smile and laugh and do all of that, it, it you just keep it PC. Um, if you develop a friendship over time, fine, but understand like these are, these are the work limits. Right. Um, and when it comes to the quality of work, the protection also comes in um, because people don't always know what they want. And so that sort of like fluttering and changing of the mind that happens, but it wasn't in the contract or it wasn't what we agreed upon. And you have to kind of nicely remind people and pull out your trusty piece of paper and say, yeah, I get it. I get everything that you're saying. I really understand. I, I'm on your side. But this piece of paper that we signed, you know what I mean? Th this agreement that we had in place, if there's something that our creatives can do to be of assistance and a solution, I'm always for that. I'm always advocating for that. But I'm always also letting the client know or my creatives or my producer know that the first answer is no let me see. Like I'll check, but I just want to remind you of what we agreed on. Right. So, so that I have a little space because honestly, you never know if what, what needs to be solved can be solved. And I've had all kinds of crazy things. Like, can you roto this thing out after the fact there's no more money? Um, you know, I wish I had a different outfit. We're already on set shooting and when wardrobe is done, you know, there's always these types of things. I wish we had more props, you know, um, but in terms of like quality of the person and quality of attitude and things of that nature, I have not um, run into any, thank goodness, extreme issues in that in that area. So I will say, like, I'm always going to support my staff. I'm always going to support my artists, right? Um, first and foremost, that's my job, right? Is to make sure that the environment that they are in, at the end of the day, it's my company. I'm the last stop uh, when it comes to any client issues. And <laughs> I had a project uh, that we were shooting and the African-American focused project I mean, this is like the blackest set I've ever had. I mean, the blackest. <laughs> I mean, like literally, which is kind of amazing because being a black, you know, company owner, when I go to shoots, wherever it is, they're like, he's a black guy. We got to get the black people. So I love it because it automatically has this effect of making sure that our crew is more diverse. And unfortunately, this is during the COVID era and we do all the COVID safety precautions and we end up having like 20 people that get COVID literally right before Christmas. And so I didn't even get to do Christmas with my in-laws. Like, so everyone now is like way upset because there's exposure and 
you know, people have parents that are immunocompromised and the whole deal. And so as a concession, immediately, my thought goes to health and safety of our crew, right? And of those that I'm working with. And so I said, anyone who is immunocompromised, worried, please go get tested right away. And of course, then it's time to get on with the client. And the response was, who gave you permission to start spending money on our behalf and spending our dime? And I had to tell said company person that the health and safety of the crew of the shoot is more important than your company dime. Um, so those situations do happen. <laughs> Uh, and that was a prime example of it. And it was like, it was interesting because I had a similar situation happen, another brand. And I remember the head of the brand coming to me via Zoom, of course. And he said to me, he goes, we appreciate all of your hard work and everything that you guys have put into this project. And he said, I would hate for someone to lose their life over soda water. And it was like the exact opposite, right? Um, and so I, I'm often reminded when situations like that happen, not everyone has the same perspective about what it is we're doing. You know, we're not doing brain surgery. We're not saving babies. You know, we're shooting television commercials or doing billboards or, you know, editing a project. Um, but yeah, those are kind of two contrasting stories in that vein. But I never have a problem and the team will tell you, if a conversation has to be had, that's my job. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, you know, I will stand my ground if I really believe in, you know, our stance and whatever it was. Thank you both. That's great. Well, this was fun. Uh, this <laughs> was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Danny. And thank you, Q, for joining us, uh, for joining this series to talk about safety and to talk about how to create safe sets and how to create belonging as uh, Danny mentioned on location and generally from the bidding process all the way through to the end thank you so much for your time absolutely thank you guys thank you for glad having you're us it. glad you're addressing it it's super important <laughs> And of course, um, in, for this uh, scope and all of our scopes, we have the full information for all of the, um, the guests and their contact information, particularly if you want to stay in contact with both Q and Danny after this episode. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Cool. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.